So, uh, just to to conclude uh, the session before the questions, um, I mean, you know, these are the problems of rare diseases, including rare cancers. So, so we have problems with clinical decision making, with organizing healthcare, with doing clinical studies. Uh, because of uh, obvious reasons, and we discussed uh, some of these reasons uh, regarding uh, some uh, rare cancers uh, in this session. Uh, classically, the solution has always been uh, centralizing patients, so referring patients uh, to centers of expertise, because uh, uh, in any case, I mean, under each of these perspectives, uh, I mean, you, you solve your problem in a way. You find the clinical expertise you need, you find the multidisciplinary team, you find open clinical studies. The downsides uh, are potentially a degree of health migration because cl clearly, centers of expertise cannot uh, stay everywhere. So there will be some uh, health migration, which may be a problem also depending on the geography of the country, of course. Um, not all patients will succeed. Some of them uh, will, uh, will not be able to get to the center of expertise. So there will be waiting lists. So there will be a kind of implicit rationing of resources, almost inevitably. It will be based on uh, uh, money, culture, uh, whatever you want, but there will be a kind of implicit rationing. And uh, also, uh, centers of expertise will be overwhelmed and uh, may also fail in routine clinical care uh, because, uh, um, because you know, uh, uh, they may be great in uh, the strategic clinical decision making about the patient and then uh, uh, may have simply too many patients to, uh, to do rather simple things. Okay, in theory, networking uh, should uh, uh, give you all the pros of uh, centralizing patients without the cons. Uh, clearly, this is a challenge. This is, uh, this is true in theory. But the challenge of networking is all, uh, I mean, is always in uh, uh, trying to, to make this a reality. Uh, so, clearly, the um, I mean, networking today is possible, is feasible to some extent because uh, the information technology is, uh, uh, is providing us uh, with tools, uh, I mean, which can be exploited for uh, clinical networking, for healthcare networking. In the end, uh, we, are, uh, we are doing now a, a TC uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, I mean, uh, we are doing a meeting uh, which, uh, which clearly last year was done a uh, completely different way. The technology was already there last year, but uh, uh, now we, we learned uh, probably to, to exploit available technologies in real world. Uh, in new ways, and we are learning uh, even uh, uh, even this afternoon. Clear. So the problem is not information technology. The problem is not the technology. Technologies are, are clearly uh, out there. The problem is how to work together. Uh, and uh, uh, clearly, this is a matter of uh, willingness, of good willingness. Clearly. But it's also a methodological problem because uh, sharing a patient uh, over a network uh, is not the same thing as uh, sharing a patient uh, within a multidisciplinary team uh, which works within the same building. 
is uh, sharing a patient uh, on a multidisciplinary basis is not the same as uh, dealing with that patient being alone, being you, the only physician, and taking care of him. Um, then uh, networking uh, is based on uh, reference centers. So clearly you have a lot of other centers around them, but uh, it's vital to have a center of expertise. So uh, you end up, you will end up uh, with a kind of hub and spoke network in a way or another. But uh, what is important to understand is that uh, uh, it's vital to have the hub and it's vital to have the spokes. The hub uh, is not uh, uh, erased by networking. This is important to understand. This is, a, this is an important point to make also with health administrators because sometimes they may say, okay, now uh, let's network. So uh, let's, uh, for example, decrease the fundings uh, to the centers of expertise. This should not happen, on the contrary. Sharing a lot of cases means that the center of expertise faces uh, more costs in terms of the resources uh, to be allocated you know, to, uh, to more patients than before. But at the same time, uh, the spoke uh, is not the spoke uh, which uh, we all would think of in a community network. In a community network, you have an hospital, for example, and then uh, in a, uh, for example, in a large territory, you have some uh, small hospitals around it. Okay, uh, this is the usual way to uh, see the spokes. On the contrary, in a rare cancer network, the spokes need to grow up as rare cancer centers. So they need to be able to share a patient uh, with a center of expertise. So the same way as uh, a medical oncologist uh, needs uh, to be um, skilled in, uh, in rare cancers as long as uh, uh, he wants to join a multidisciplinary team within his institution. Okay, the same, the same way uh, he spoke needs to grow up as a rare cancer spoke in order to be able to share patients with a sarcoma, for example, pathologist, the sarcoma surgeon, uh, and uh, treat the patient for many months, for example, with chemotherapy, and uh, uh, I mean, uh, being able to, uh, to agree upon everything with the other specialists. So, uh, the spoke needs to be, in a rare cancer network, needs to be a high quality clinical center. And then we have a new kind of patient, the network patient. We called it the network patient within the joint action or rare cancers because it's a new kind of patient. And uh, uh, making sure that uh, uh, this patient uh, is. Uh, uh, is complying with some quality criteria. I mean, uh, is care complies with some quality criteria. It's not easy because uh, you don't have just clinical criteria. You have also organizational criteria by which that patient uh, will be uh, dealt with appropriately. For example, in our network, uh, a big problem is the uh, compliance with timelines, you know, because clearly, a, 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 for example, a sarcoma patient doing a new adjuvant chemotherapy needs to be operated on the right time, I mean, not uh, without losing any time and so on. So uh, there is something more uh, to be complied with uh, in a network. So we tried uh, within the joint action or rare cancers, uh, uh, which uh, Annalisa alluded to before, uh, we tried to um, work out uh, 10 recommendations, 10 big recommendations. These are the first five, and these are the other five. Uh, so you find all of them uh, in, the, uh, in this booklet, uh, which uh, uh, 
this one, uh, which is available uh, uh, on the web, uh, even for free. You can download uh, uh, this, uh, this booklet as a PDF file for free at this website. And uh, uh, we try to work out uh, 10 chapters, 10 small chapters, uh, each of them uh, on uh, uh, each of these 10 recommendations. The last one, the last chapter was uh, filled in by pension groups, by rare cancer pension groups in Europe. So uh, the title is Rare Cancer Agenda 2030, because clearly this is an agenda for the next years. Uh, you may say that these are dreams uh, to some extent, but they uh, should not be dreams. They, uh, they should be uh, implemented. And I would like uh, to end uh, by stressing uh, the rare adult solid cancers, because, uh, you know, pediatric oncology uh, is very well developed. Uh, there are uh, uh, pediatric oncology institutions, uh, high level, in a sense, uh, centralizing uh, uh, children with cancer is uh, a little bit easier, even because uh, these cancers are just 1% of all cancer cases. Hematoncology oncology is, uh, I mean, is a wonderful tradition, uh, even academically, in terms of institutions deployed in the community and so on. So uh, they are two specialties. You know? But no specialty does exist about uh, rare adult solid cancers. So, in a sense, uh, these tumors uh, are a priority for us at the moment. Uh, and uh, we are trying, for example, to, uh, to train young oncologists deciding to specialize in these rare adult solid cancers. And also, uh, this session today uh, was organized uh, around uh, some of these uh, rare adult solid cancers uh, to, to stress the value of uh, uh, doing medical education uh, on these tumors. And in fact, uh, uh, now we, we have been uh, uh, holding this uh, uh, clinical update uh, uh, meeting on rare adult solid cancers uh, for four times in Milan uh, now annually. Uh, it's a ISO ESMO event uh, promoted by the Joint Action and by, in collaboration with Europe and with the European uh, Reference Network on, on these tumors. Uh, and uh, uh, we will do it again, uh, not in December 2020, but in January 2021, so one month later for uh, several good reasons, as you may understand. Uh, probably it will be uh, online. Uh, so, in a sense, it may be even easier for young oncologists from all over the world to attend. We received a lot of requests for, uh, uh, for travel grants in the past that uh, we couldn't uh, uh, meet. Uh, and so, I, I hope that uh, switching to, uh, to an online meeting might, uh, might improve at least uh, the numbers uh, of attendees. Uh, again, uh, with the idea of uh, uh, making it possible to have in the future oncologists, clinical oncologists, specializing in these uh, rare adult solid cancers. Thank you.